She was like, oh, we're not going to make it. We can't make it. We can see flames under the door. We can see flames under the door. Unspeakable pain after a terrifying tragedy. Good evening, I'm Mark Kelly, and this is The National. It needn't have happened. And the people responsible are either the politicians or their advisers. Anger grows after a high-rise fire in London. Who's to blame? The sophisticated propaganda targeting Canadian troops in Europe. It's not just, you know, some bloggers or trolls having fun. And school's almost out for the summer. Peter and At Issue are here to wrap up a busy season on Parliament Hill. London firefighters spent the day combing through the ruins of a burned out high rise. At least 17 people died yesterday when the fire ripped through the building. That number is expected to rise as many of the floors have yet to be searched. And as the CBC's Margaret Evans explains, while the flames have been extinguished, the anger has not. Grenfell Tower. It looms on the London skyline like a tombstone and an accusation. The number of dead encased within it, still unknown. On the ground below, the suffering is like an open wound. The very f last few words that she said to me was, please forgive me if I've said anything to upset you or hurt you. Um, I don't think we're going to make it out of the building. Mohammed Hakim is talking about his mother. He also fears he's lost his father and all three of his siblings. And no one wants to give us any information about where their whereabouts are, if they're still within the building or not. Today, firemen seem to hang from the clouds as they tried to gauge safety while they searched. The number of dead is expected to rise, perhaps dramatically. The size of this building, it could take weeks. I want to be realistic, this is a very long process. The first confirmed victim has been named as Mohammed al Hajali, a Syrian refugee and an engineering student. Anybody want a drink? Donations, volunteers and sympathy have been pouring in to help the survivors. As you can see from all of the activity behind me, volunteers packing boxes, the outpouring of support has been enormous, but so too is the weight of what's happened. And along with all the grief on the streets here, anger is growing, people want answers. The British Prime Minister Theresa May has called for a full public inquiry. But angry residents and fire safety experts say warnings were ignored in the past. This tragedy is totally avoidable. I would say it is wicked that these people have had to die. Surveyor Arnold Tarling singles out cladding on the outside of the building as one possible reason for the rapid spread of the fire, something he's warned about in the past. And I said this will happen in this country. There will be multiple fatalities as a result if these cladding systems are not changed. Little comfort for Adrian Asinor, who watched people hurl themselves from Grenfell Tower from the building he grew up in just like it. It's just really opened my eyes to how unsafe it could possibly be in the future. A future that for the grieving seems as bleak and as black as the charred face of the tower staring down at them. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. British Prime Minister Theresa May met with representatives from Northern Ireland parties today. She's working on a deal to get the Democratic Unionist Party to support her minority government. Outside Downing Street, the president of Sinn Féin expressed his concerns. We have just uh, finished a meeting with the British Prime Minister and her Secretary of State. And uh, we told her very directly that she was in breach of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Sinn Féin fears a deal with the DUP will get in the way of power sharing in Northern Ireland. A witch hunt and a phony story with zero proof. That's how U.S. President Donald Trump is responding today to reports he's under investigation for possible obstruction of justice. It's part of a, of a widening probe looking at Russian meddling during last year's election. Paul Hunter has the latest. When asked about it this morning... Mr. President, do you believe that you are under investigation now? 
Donald Trump didn't answer. But by Twitter, yet again, he held back little. The single greatest witch hunt in American political history, he called it today. At issue, reports Special Prosecutor Bob Mueller is now targeting Trump specifically. Mueller is investigating alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia in last year's election. But now there's word he's dramatically broadening that to include whether Trump himself tried to thwart that investigation. Did he try to obstruct justice, denied often by Trump? No collusion, no obstruction. And in another tweet today, they made up a phony collusion with the Russian story, found zero proof, he wrote. So now they go for obstruction of justice on the phony story. Nice. Later, Trump also tweeted, it's Hillary Clinton who should be investigated. Still, tonight, there's word Vice President Mike Pence has now followed Trump's lead and hired a private lawyer to deal with all aspects of the Russia investigation. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. The whole thing intensified last week when former FBI Director James Comey testified Trump had urged him to ease up on his investigation of Russia. I took it as a direction. I mean, this is the President of the United States. Say Democrats tonight. I'll remind you, going back to Watergate days, the saying was, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. Uh, and if the president was personally involved in action uh, to try and uh, thwart or redirect uh, the investigation by the FBI, uh, that's a significant matter. If Mueller is now investigating Trump, the president himself could be questioned on all of it directly. Trump's already emphasized he'll go under oath on it. One hundred percent. If the reports are true, less than five months into his presidency, and Donald Trump will face hard questions on what is an impeachable offense. And though we're a long way from that, no matter how you look at it, Bob Mueller may well have just nudged the White House on a path toward that. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. A charity ball game in Washington went ahead tonight, a day after a gunman opened fire at a field where Republican lawmakers were practicing. A police officer injured in yesterday's shooting threw out the first pitch. The game between Republicans and Democrats is a 100-year-old tradition. Last night, Donald Trump visited victims in hospital. House Majority Whip Steve Scalise remains in critical condition. Investigators were at the scene of the shooting today. The FBI believes James T. Hodgkinson purchased two firearms legally from licensed dealers. An update today on the health of an American man who was just freed from months of detention in North Korea, and it is troubling. Otter Warmbier has a severe brain injury. Doctors can't say why, but his family has no doubts. Ron Charles has that story. These are the last words the world heard from American student Otto Warmbier. I beg that you see how I am only human. How I have made the worst mistake of my life. The North Korean court ignored his impassioned plea for mercy in March 2016. It sentenced him to 15 years hard labor for attempting to remove a propaganda poster inside his Pyongyang hotel. Evidence now suggests that within weeks of being led away to start his sentence, Warmbier was severely brain damaged. This week, a year and a half later, the North Koreans sent him home in a condition commonly known as a persistent vegetative state. He shows no signs of understanding language, responding to verbal commands, or awareness of his surroundings. Doctors say they can't tell precisely what led to Warmbier's massive brain damage, but they suspect it may have been cardiopulmonary arrest. Where the blood supply to the brain is inadequate for a period of time, resulting in the death of brain tissue. North Korean officials say Warmbier fell into a coma after contracting botulism and being administered a sleeping pill. His father, Fred, symbolically wearing the same jacket his son wore in court, I'm, rejected that. I'm so proud of Otto, my son, who has been in a pariah regime for the last 18 months, brutalized and terrorized. Fred Warmbier credits U.S. President Donald Trump's new administration for securing his son's release. Do I think the past administration could have done more? I think the results speak for themselves.
People from Warren Beer's hometown wore blue today in honor of a young man seeking adventure whose life is now changed forever. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. A U.S. court ruling is raising new questions tonight over a controversial oil pipeline project. Approving the Dakota Access Pipeline was one of Donald Trump's first decisions in office. His executive order swept aside months of protest by two Sioux Indian tribes concerned about the project's impact. But now a judge has ordered a review, finding the environmental assessment for the pipeline did not adequately consider the impact of an oil spill on fishing and hunting rights. The project's proposed route stretches 1,900 kilometers from North Dakota to Illinois. Coming up. It's pretty sweet yeah. because uh, you can use it anywhere you want to go in the world. The new freedoms coming for Canadians who want to switch phone companies. And later, Andrew, Chantal, Althea Raj and Jennifer Ditchburn join Peter to talk about the winners and losers of this political season. The RCMP's top officer made a surprise appearance in a New Brunswick court today as a witness for the defense. His force is on trial for labor code breaches, alleging three Mounties were seriously short on firepower when a gunman killed them on the streets of Moncton back in 2014. Alison Crawford was in the courtroom in Moncton. The RCMP commissioner had this to say after a full day as the trial's final witness. So, well, I'm the accused. Uh, I represent the RCMP and I, uh, as the accused individual, the commissioner that's on the charge, I thought it uh, appropriate to come and tell my story. So. The RCMP stands accused of failing its frontline officers in Moncton by not providing them with adequate equipment and training to keep them safe during the shooting rampage three years ago. Three constables were shot dead and two more wounded in the incident. The entire city was locked down during a manhunt that lasted more than 24 hours. Justin Bork had a high-powered rifle and a shotgun when he targeted police armed with pistols. The central issue has been whether Mountie should have been equipped with short-barreled semi-automatic rifles called carbines. First recommended in 2006, the RCMP agreed to acquire them in 2011. Yet officers in Moncton still didn't have them three years later. Crown Prosecutor Paul Adams asked if it was reasonable to have taken seven years to roll out the new firearms. Paulson said yes because they needed to study the idea and justify the decision. Under questioning from the RCMP's lawyer, Mark Ertl, Paulson expressed concerns about the militarization of the RCMP. The RCMP had to consider the impact of military-style firearms, military uniforms and military vehicles on the communities it serves. Ertl asked Paulson, should the RCMP have anticipated an active outdoor shooter scenario and trained for it? Paulson said, no. The Crown brought up Marathorpe, Alberta and several other incidents where on-duty officers died at the hands of someone with a rifle. That's when Paulson appeared to be on the brink of tears. Paulson said, it doesn't follow that if the officers in Marathorpe had a carbine, they wouldn't have been killed. During his testimony, Paulson said, I am the commissioner of the RCMP and I am accountable for the safety of my officers. The Crown then responded by asking, are you now then ready to take responsibility for the deaths of those officers? And Paulson responded, no. Alison Crawford, CBC News, Moncton. After days of deliberating, the jury in the Bill Cosby sexual assault trial emerged, but not to deliver a verdict. Jurors told the judge they're deadlocked and can't reach a unanimous decision on any of the three counts against Cosby. The judge instructed them to go back and keep trying. Since deliberations began on Monday, the jury has asked for multiple clarifications and reviews of testimony. Well, barely into their NATO mission in Latvia, Canadian troops have started taking a few shots from Russia, but no bullets are involved. The weapons of choice in this fight are words, innuendos, exaggerations, even outright lies. The CBC's Chris Brown explains. For Canada's battle group in Latvia, the most immediate threat likely isn't a military assault from Russia, but a propaganda one aimed at discrediting Canada's reputation. In fact, after only a few days here, it started. Russian language publication posted photos of disgraced former Canadian colonel and killer Russell Williams. The intent was to mock Canada's military. The headline screams, the gay battle group NATO has dug into Latvia. The only decent army in NATO are the Americans, writes the author. All of the others are deeply comical. Latvia's army commander, an expert in Russian propaganda, says he's been waiting for something like this. 
It happened to the German uh, deployed troops in Lithuania. It happened to British troops in Estonia. It happened to American troops deployed to Poland. At the Baltic Center for Media Excellence in Riga, they study Russian propaganda. Rita Rusuda says there's usually a minor negative incident, and the story is then torqued for political purposes. Something is, is picked on and blown out of proportion. Take this story that tries to whip up fear by suggesting NATO troops could be wandering around with loaded guns. We even found one of the CBC stories we wrote translated into Russian by the pro-Putin website Sputnik. It jumped on the idea that we found lots of Latvians opposed to the NATO mission, which was an exaggeration. It's a strategically and very cleverly planned campaign to weaken uh, our resilience, our as a society's resilience to any sort of threat. So it's not just, you know, some bloggers or trolls having fun. This is uh, very well done, if I may say so. What, you know, Mr. Williams did is, is appalling. The commander of Canada's Latvia mission says he expected Williams' past would come up that acknowledges they can't correct every story. We can't stop people from, from using the internet and, and posting and blogging, uh, but we can be aware of what they're doing and when it's appropriate, uh, we'll take uh, actions that are necessary to, uh, to set the record straight. The propaganda reinforces the official Russian position on Canada and NATO that their presence here is aggressive and unnecessary. As to whether the message could eventually undermine public support for NATO's mission, those studying the issue here say the evidence points to yes. Chris Brown, CBC News in Riga, Latvia. Meanwhile, the construction of a bridge to connect mainland Russia with Crimea is on schedule and should be operational by the end of next year. President Vladimir Putin made the comment during his annual call-in show on Russian television. He also fielded questions about sanctions imposed by the United States and said jokingly if fired FBI Director James Comey faced political persecution in the U.S., Russia could offer him asylum. A horrifying scene today at a hotel and a restaurant in the Somali capital. Islamist militants ignited a car bomb and launched a gun attack, killing at least 31 people. Al-Shabaab, a group affiliated with Al-Qaeda, has claimed responsibility. And nearly two weeks after it was the scene of an attack, a London market has reopened to the public. Today, Prince Harry made a surprise visit, stopping at shops and stalls to speak with some of the vendors. Eight people were killed when Islamist militants drove into pedestrians on London Bridge and stabbed people in the market. Well, one person is in hospital with serious injuries after a scary incident today near the U.S. Open Golf Tournament. A manned blimp caught fire and crashed to the ground. Oh, God. Oh, no, it's going down. The pilot was able to parachute out just before the blimp burst into flames in a nearby field. He was taken to hospital with serious burns. Straight ahead, the new rights that will set your cell phone free. Have I got a panel for you. Five award-winning journalists, many in the areas of investigative journalism. They're known for their great reporting. I've, I've had some threats. Um, it's a reality. There are people out there that will write you nasty things. I think 2002, we did a gang documentary, and leading up to it, I think I had eight written death threats. I think gang leaders in Vancouver thought we were going to name them and out them, and we don't do the work of the police. And we took some pretty extreme precautions. I have special glass on my back door, thanks to the CBC. Um, and, you know, you can't find me easily. You really protect your children and your name, because sometimes you never know who you're going to tick off. And we've done stories about organized crime. We've done stories about terror suspects, for example. And uh, when I talk to new journalists who we mentor, I often say, you know, be really careful about exposing your children and your family um, and being easy to find physically, because there are people out there who can be dangerous. I have... I have relationships with my stories, and and I know that sounds strange, but I almost, uh, there have been times when I have come home from something awful where I can still smell like the iron of blood, 
and it doesn't leave my nose for a while. And I walk down the street and I sometimes feel like my stories are constantly tapping me on the shoulder. And I sort of, I have this little ritual with them where I let them do this for a while. And then at some point, I have caught myself standing in the street and saying, oh, enough, enough, you've had your time, enough. You stay here, I'm gonna keep going. Very early in my career, I think I was 25, um, I certainly didn't look like I knew what I was doing, and I'm not really sure that I did, but I remember interviewing someone, and it, I was about to put something in front of him and, and accuse him of something. And I was actually sort of far more nervous than I ever wanted to give up, but he thought I was just adorable. Yeah. And I remember him actually trying to charm me by speaking a little French. And I was actually so annoyed at that point that he clearly thought I was no threat at all that you know, I stopped shaking, I stopped being nervous, and that might have been one of my finest moments ever. I remember it like 25 years later. So um, sometimes it's frustrating for all the same reasons that women in every profession have expressed their frustrations, but every now and then it works for you, and those are good. It's too early to know whether to call it a blip or a correction, but it looks like Ontario's recent measures to cool down Toronto's housing market are working better than a brand new central air conditioning system after a gut reno. Here are the new numbers. From April to May, the Greater Toronto Area sales were down more than a staggering 25%, dropping the national numbers about 6%, the biggest dip in five years. So what about the prices? Yes, they've declined 7% in Toronto area from April to May, but they're still up compared to last year. Nationally, the average price for a home is more than half a million dollars, pulled up by Toronto and Vancouver. One cost that's not going up, high-speed streaming of videos and music. The so-called Netflix Netflix tax has been squashed by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau after it was recommended by a parliamentary committee. Trudeau said the 5% tax on broadband internet would target the middle class and run counter to his election promises. The committee estimated it could raise hundreds of millions of dollars for the Canadian Media Fund and help out a struggling sector. Meanwhile, Canada's telecom companies are being told they can't lock up your smartphone anymore. The companies have long sold lock phones that only work on their own networks and have raked in millions charging customers to unlock them. But the CRTC now says those days are numbered. Aaron Salzman reports. So firstly, what you would need to do is to... Every day, about a dozen customers ask Richard Martin to unlock their cell phones. How does he feel about losing all that business? That it's f***ing awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, locked phones are so annoying, even someone who makes money off of them is overjoyed to be rid of them. The news came from the CRTC today, after a public hearing earlier this year. From December 1st on, any new phones that are provided to clients will have to be provided unlocked and anyone who currently has a cell phone that is locked can ask for it to be unlocked without charge. Telecoms sell phones that are locked to their service only. If you're traveling, you can't swap out the SIM card for local service. You have to pay roaming costs. And if a customer wants to switch to another carrier, even after their contract is up, the telecom charges a fee, about 50 bucks, to unlock the phone and allow it to be used with another company. Some called this a ransom fee. Consumers were reluctant to switch companies if they had to pay. Now they won't have to. Very good. <laughs> it's pretty sweet because uh, you can use it anywhere you want to go in the world. Industry watchers say that freedom will mean increased competition. Now consumers are going to feel so much more free to jump from carrier to carrier and I think it will spark perhaps lower cost plans in the future. And now it says network unlock successful. Back at the cell phone shop, Richard Martin is more than on side. It really is fantastic for consumers. Um, you know, we own these devices, we should be allowed to do what we want with them. Canadian telecom companies collected more than $37 million in unlocking fees last year alone. Some expect they'll try to make up that revenue by raising prices on something else. The companies told us they are reviewing today's decision. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. 
Here's something you don't see every day. A wayward beluga trapped in a northern New Brunswick river has been airlifted to a new home in Quebec. The rescue was carried out by scientists who caught the male whale and flew him to the St. Lawrence River, where he'll be meeting up with an adoptive pod of belugas. The whale was hooked up to an IV for the duration of his flight, and while researchers say he wasn't too stressed on the journey, he's underweight and his skin is in rough condition. Peter and At Issue are coming up after the break and later. If you come across as preaching your political agenda, you're going to alienate everybody who doesn't agree with you. New video games head into a different dimension. The risks and rewards of bringing politics to players. Time now for the day's business numbers. The TSX dropped nine points. The dollar closed down almost half a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 14 points. The price of oil fell 27 cents a barrel. He just gave the blah, blah, blah. This is Roger Tetro. He's a Montreal bill collector. That's his job. He also holds news conferences. That's his hobby. Here's Tetro three years ago, posing as the president of a fictional group called Water Aid for America, urging that Canada ship its water to the drought-stricken U.S. The national media gobbled it up. Here is the CBC News. A group of Montreal residents wants to pressure the Canadian government into diverting water from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River. The French language network of the CBC believed Tetro was also a nuclear expert. Here he is telling a national audience how the Chernobyl disaster could rain down assorted horrors on North Americans. The now defunct Montreal Daily News had him under another name, Tubal Kane, and yet another vocation. It's been going on for years. In 1971, the Montreal Star thought it had a scoop an internal CIA memo outlining covert operations in Quebec. It even made The National on CBC. Under a CIA letterhead, the document reads, Subject, Quebec. It was Tetro's work, of course. Around the same time, he suckered the Toronto Star Weekly with a phony FLQ terrorist camp in the Laurentian Hills. I told myself, if they want fiction, I'll give them fiction. So I gave them fiction. Tetro says there are many others like him. Only nowadays, they're known as media consultants and spin doctors. Whoever's uh, got an axe to grind, they give their spin to it and they get into the media and uh, that's the story that goes out. He's absolutely right. Uh, governments, uh, anybody who's covered governments or followed things they do, uh, know that they uh, engage in this, where you want to call them trial balloons or disinformation, uh, they do it frequently. Is Tetro's career as a hoaxer over? Perhaps, but he says he'll certainly keep trying, guided by the firm belief that there's a reporter born every minute. He mouthed two words, the first word of which uh, started with F and the second word of which started with O. Well, it, it's a lie because I didn't say anything. Did you mouth, Sir, did did you you mouth it? What does mouth mean? Move, move, move your lips. Move your, yes, I move my lips. And the words you've been quoted as saying? No. Did you intend to give What, what did you what move were you your thinking? Lips? when you moved your lips. What is the nature of your thoughts, gentlemen, when you say fuddle-duddle or something like that? God, you... Well, the big topic on Parliament Hill today wasn't the Constitution, it wasn't the economy, it was the Prime Minister and his language. I heard him say very clearly, f***ing bastard. I convey to the Speaker uh, my regrets for any inconvenience, and I convey to any honourable member of the House uh, my regrets to them. Just... Quieting down, baby. <laughs> Liberal Sheila Copps didn't think the remark was very funny. I'm not his baby, and I'm nobody's baby, and I'd like him to withdraw those remarks. The House is no stranger to heated exchanges, but few have been this heated or this strange. Heat or shame. Now, I hear the word racist from that side. Do you have the fortitude or the gonads to stand up and come across here and say that to me, you son of a bitch? Come on! Daryl. Daryl. Order. Order. Stinson came within three meters of liberal John Cannis before returning to his seat. It was too much for one liberal MP. Shh. 
I did not say fuddle duddle. That was another generation. I, I, I think that we've reached a point where this type of uh, conduct, it's not only disgraceful, but it's unacceptable. Enjoy this annual Ad Issue show, a chance to rate the past parliamentary season. What worked, what didn't, who's up, who isn't. Andrew and Chantel are both here, and so are Althea Raj and Jennifer Ditchburn. So let's get uh, right to it. First question, Andrew, who took the biggest risk in this past year? I guess I would say Justin Trudeau in uh, reneging on his one of his central campaign promises of electoral reform. Uh, I mean, you couldn't have made it a more black letter, unequivocal promise, and then, whoops, it was all gone down the memory hole. A lot of people would say, well, it wasn't that big a risk, nobody cares, it's just an issue for wonks, etc., and they may be true in the short term. I think it has done some damage or may do some damage to them in the long run. There's a reason why they made that promise. It was to show to particularly left-wing voters that we're different kinds of liberals, we're more idealistic, we're more interested in shaking things up. A lot of those people, I think, are, have taken note of that, and they don't look at them the same way. You know, people keep saying there's been damage done, and yet the numbers don't seem to back up. We'll ha we, you have to see in the long run. Okay. And Chantal. then Stephen Harper is still prime minister. That's because right. I'm <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, let's not go there. I picked Maxime Bernier for running for the leadership of a major party on something other than a political pablum. And a risk taken is not always a risk uh, that uh, ends well, and it didn't. And uh, I'm not sure it's going to be an example that very many... Uh, leadership candidates will want to uh, imitate because if you look at someone else who ran on clear policy, Michael Chong, mm -hmm. uh, Kelly Leach, didn't do so well in the end. Political pablum sells. Political pablum sells. There's your loss. Forty-nine percent. Althea. But it still sells. Mm. I would say Kelly Leach because I don't think she put forward a political pablum. I think she ran on a basically an anti-immigration platform and I think that in the long run that will do her a lot of harm. She was only able to capture about 7% of the conservative membership voters. And I think that if Andrew Scheer puts her in the front bench, it will be a very detrimental to the conservative brand going into the next election. So I think basically she's done because of that that campaign ideology. All right. I, I think Jennifer's also picking Kelly Leach, mm -hmm. so let's remind everybody of what that big promise was from Kelly Leach. Here it is. I can tell you that I have new Canadians every single day joining my campaign because they chose most recently to come here, to Canada, because of the values that we share, hard work, generosity, freedom, and tolerance. All right, so she sounded pretty confident there. What was the risk? Well, she risked a lot of things. I think she risked her political reputation. She risked her political friendships and relationships. She risked a potentially um, big uh, division within the party, should she have won. Uh, and she risked, I think more importantly, exacerbating um, racial tensions in the country. And thank God that that risk failed. What was the most underreported political story of the year, Chantal? I think it comes in a pair uh, in, in the fascination over Kevin O'Leary, Kelly Leach, uh, and at some point Maxime Bernier. No one really kicked the tires uh, on the policy front uh, of Andrew Scheer, who is now the actual uh, prime minister, proposed prime minister on the conservative side of the aisle. Uh, it's political philosophy. None of that was really severely tested uh, in any way, shape, or form. I, can't think of very many leadership candidates that we have known so little about uh, than Andrew Scheer for this kind of job. And that's not a criticism of him, but of the fact that he was Speaker of the House of Commons for the, the, the majority Harper government. So he wasn't in the action. He has left no paper trail. I'll see him. I think the underreported story is the closeness relationship between Team Trudeau and Donald Trump's team. There's been very little written uh, or discussed about, for example, Katie Telford, Trudeau's chief of staff, her close relationship with Jared Kushner and his wife Ivanka. And this and is one that's developed since the election, right? Yes, since the election. I mean, the, the tr Team Trudeau has been very good at making inroads, but the fact that these people talk to each other sometimes several times a day has not been discussed. Several times a day? Yes. That's a lot for Ottawa. Yes, Washington and you think we should have been writing about it kind. more of it, don't you think? Yeah. Well, if it's that often, we should have. Jennifer. Uh, the NDP leadership race. 
I mean, I'm coming at it a little bit from the outside because I'm not reporting on the Hill anymore. But to me, uh, there has been very little uh, attention given to a race that I think will have a very uh, big implications in 2019. The NDP, if they could bring back some of the vote that were taken away from them by the Liberals, could uh, could really change the whole outlook for the, the next election. So to, from my perspective, I don't think there's been very much attention to that race. Andrew. Uh, the growing uh, rebelliousness, I might say, presumptuousness of the Senate vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Commons. I, there's been some reporting, but I don't think where people have fully grasped how consequential this is and can be, and not just proposing amendments, but threatening to defeat the bill if their amendments aren't accepted, coming very close. So the, the convention in the past, not always observed, I might say, but the convention certainly was, if you're an unelected House, if you're a body of appointees, you have no business overruling the people's elected representatives. A lot of senators now, in this new Senate we're supposedly in, where they're independent and they're merit-based and all these kinds of things, seem to feel that they've been released from that bondage. And now they've got sort of the mandate of virtue, and they can go and, and overturn um, legislation passed by the Commons. Um, at some point, this is going to come to a head, and, and I, I'm not sure everyone's worked out exactly how that's going to play out. All right, Althea, you start us on this one. What was the most overblown story of the year? I think it was liberal fundraisers. I still fail to understand how what the liberal government and Team Trudeau is doing is so different than what Stephen Harper was doing. And there were definitely missteps, but I think that in terms of, you know, there were some lobbyists who should not have been at some dinners, but we have yet to see you know, a decision being made because of a fundraiser. And we spent so much time talking about it that it really felt like it it was an issue, it should have been dealt with, but I don't think it was worth the ink that was spilled. Would we know that no decision has been made on the basis of something that happened behind closed doors? Well, we haven't seen any proof that that has happened. The dog didn't bark, but the dog was still there. But how is that any different than under Stephen Harper? But I thought it was but supposed to be was, different. Yes. Isn't that the point? <laughs> right, but I don't think that... I just, I feel like they, we made a big deal of something that I'm not sure was worth the amount of information that we had to to spend that much time talking okay, about so it. Okay, so you're not dismissing the issue, you're saying we spent too much time on it. I, yes. Okay. Uh, Kevin O'Leary. <laughs> and just uh, picking up on something that Chantal said earlier about um, people within the conservative leadership race that had something to say on policy, like Michael Chong or Aaron O'Toole, I think that the, all the attention, and, and I, you know, had I been reporting, I totally admit, I would have been doing all those stories. I know how the business works. But uh, for the amount of support that he ended up I mean, we don't really know, but that he ended up having, was it worth all of that ink spilled on, on the shiny object? And by the way, all the comparisons to him being uh, the next Donald Trump or a populist, this or that, that was just, I mean, that was a waste of time. Well, whatever support he <laughs> it had, it wasn't enough, enough <laughs> to push uh, Bernier over yes. the top. Andrew. Uh, motion 103. Uh, this was a motion of the parliament. It was essentially an expression of MPs' opinion. Nothing more has no legislative or legal power, whatever. Uh, essentially expressing alarm over the rise of Islamophobia was the word that seemed to get people excited. Uh, but when you see, in fact, that there are rising numbers of hate crimes against uh, Muslims, when this was, I know the bill was, the motion was proposed before the uh, massacre in Quebec City, but it was certainly considered in that light. Um, people made that into this enormous crisis of free speech. And believe me, I am a free speech absolutist. If I thought there was any absolute, any actual uh, threat to people's ability to speak on these issues, I'd be up in arms, but it wasn't. Chantel, I'm gonna show you what yours was. It's a highlight reel of what your overblown story was. Here it is. I would like to uh, apologize uh, for my mistake. I, I deeply regret it. And I'm truly sorry for it. That's a good one. <laughs> the kind of things that got said in the House of Commons on the opposition side over this, you would have sworn that this man had gone into combat, run away, and claimed a medal, rather than use the improper article and say, I was a, an architect of the Medusa mission, not the architect. It was really interesting because when all this was going on, I live in French and English. I tune into the French news, and he was nowhere in the newscast. Uh, because at some point, it, it kind of died you know, after one day, but it kept on going and going. It was painful to watch, and, and it reminds you of how quickly uh, 
politicians uh, like to go at each other and destroy each other. Yeah, mind you, reporters who talked to people in the military said there was genuine discomfort, dismay among military people at his Possibly, but plan. people, reporters who spoke to people in the military also heard a lot about his input and yeah. his role right. in yeah. that yeah. mission. Nobody disputed so, that. Uh, oh. At the end of the day, he didn't pretend to be somewhere where he had no role. Right. And, and you can't take away from the fact that he had a distinguished battlefield record. Yeah. Uh, well, it makes it the all the odder that he would have made this exactly. odd claim. Yeah. The political lesson of the year can be from anywhere. What was it, Jennifer? Uh, I think that the that you can't count on voters to do what you think that they're going to do. Um, <laughs> Nick Nanos, the pollster, has been talking about the volatility in the electorate. And um, I think Theresa May is a great example of that. I'm not taking for granted how things might turn out. And um, uh, referring to somebody else, Doug Saunders in the Globe and Mail talked about how we're seeing the push and pull of the anti-politics side of the things and also the traditional inclusive kind of politics. And it's going back and forth, back and forth like this. And so I think Theresa May's uh, experience tells us just how things, disrupted things are. Andrew. Sort of similar to that, but in a more direct thing of the populist rising that was supposedly inevitable, out of touch elites didn't get it. The people were speaking around the world. It was they were throwing off the elites, etc. Well, if you look at what happened, you know, yeah, Trump squeaked through. Uh, uh, Macron won on a decidedly anti-populist message in France. The British last election, I think the best single interpretation of it was it was buyer's remorse at Brexit, which was supposedly the big populist revolt. Um, and in, in the Canadian, in the Conservative election, the, the populist candidates finished way, way back in the back. So nothing is for sure, and including grand sweeping pronouncements about this is the tide of history. <laughs> mm -hmm. How quickly government agendas uh, fall by the wayside uh, when governments uh, have to be defined by crises that come their way. Uh, and if you look at Justin Trudeau's last year and his mandate, it will be remembered for having a before and an after. And the line is the American election. Everything that was true mm. the day before was no longer valid the next day. Uh, and that was also true of 9-11, mm -hmm. the close result of the uh, Quebec referendum. For It doesn't mean you're going to get defeated, but it does mean that everything, all your game plan is no longer valid. Yes. I'll take a break, but Althea on this question before we do. Uh, don't take anything for granted. A little bit like Jen, but I, I'm thinking more about Maxime Bernier. You know, he came into that leadership convention thinking that he had it sewn up. He barely gave a speech off the cuff for about two minutes with this big produced video telling people, you know, wait for my speech it's coming up tomorrow. And he didn't court voters the way Andrew Shear did. And maybe he lost it on Saturday. We don't actually know because the party hasn't told us, released the numbers yet. But he, he took it for granted. And he took it for granted based on the people who were whispering in his ear that you've got it in the bag. Yeah. I think so, and I think the numbers that he had from the voters who had already cast a ballot, but you know, there was a ton of people voting the next day that he sure. didn't court. And some of his people spoke out of turn in a really yes. embarrassing way. Well, right. talk about Maxim Bernier signing off on an email to say, I'll oh, remember everyone who supported yeah. me, you've got yeah. until 6 o'clock to get on board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'd say the same thing on that too. Somebody told him to sign off on it, right? Yes, you know, you, but you've if got you want to, have, to be leader... You, yeah, no, 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 if you're going to be leader, You've got to ensure that the people who are immediately around you, oh, absolutely. it could be a party leader, it could be a prime minister, yep. uh, you know, it could be a premier, whatever. If, if those people around you aren't, uh, have your absolute trust and yep. faith in their advice, uh, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Yep. Anyway, time for a quick break. But when we come back after this parliament season, how would you make the argument that Canadian politics is alive and well? another category of goods that has transformed our world, the gadgets or the tools of the electronic media. Here are some film projectors, the movies. I wonder what it really means, though, to be able to flick a switch and to bring in any part of the world to see the most personal relationships of mankind acted out before us. It's so easy, isn't it? A handy, instantaneous gadget. The tape recorder. Small, portable, 
can go and the has gone everywhere. India, just a button's push away. Space means nothing. Uh, with a record collection, neither space nor time matter. We can, all of us, share in everything from anywhere and any time. Well, back to box day with the uh, flick of a wrist. Fabian, Frankie Avalon, uh, the voice of FDR, Petrushka, the music of Arabia, the sound of a sports car race in Florida. Even the most Puritan among us engages now each and every day in an absolute Roman carnival of the senses. There are new sights, new sounds, new fabrics, new textures. Well, we're all dedicated libertines. And radio. Well, we've heard the sound of symphonies, of riots, and of battles, and all without leaving the living room. And now, radio goes with us to beach parties. Or to the baseball game. And each of us with our own private slice of the modern age. We're never out of touch. And television? Well, I wonder who really knows what it means to have pouring into our homes day after day the cowboys, the rock and roll singers, the statesmen, the philosophers, the whole debate of our modern world. Well, surely, our sense of space, of time, of cause and effect must be changing. And our attitudes to life and love, to religion, politics and leisure, what of them? Oh, I... I almost forgot the telephone. Uh, we can afford to take it for granted because it's been around so long. Surely, though, our, our sense of space, of distance, the uh, relationship of person from person no longer means what it did. And you'll notice that the image of the telephone goes with the teenager because he's the only one completely at home using it. And he uses it all the time. That's annoying, isn't it, to be held up even five minutes? Must be a teenager on the other end. Well, there they are. Our new electronic media, or our new gadgets. You push a button, and the world's yours. You know how they talk about the world getting smaller? Well, it's thanks to these that it is. Everywhere is now our own neighborhood. We know what it's like to go on safari in Kenya, or to have an audience with the Pope to order a cognac in a Paris cafe. But not only is the world getting smaller, it's becoming more available and more familiar to our minds and to our emotions. The world is now a global village. Welcome back. Andrew, Chantel, Althea, and Jennifer are all at the table tonight. Here's the question. Where is Justin Trudeau most vulnerable heading into the second half of his term, Andrew? I think the issue is him. I mean, we have a very leadership-focused politics to begin with, but this prime minister is particularly leadership-focused. And where that was a great positive for them in the last election, I think there's increasing concerns and doubts people have that he's just, uh, just as two-faced, just as controlling as Stephen Harper. Um, that behind that sort of veneer of idealism, et cetera, is actually quite a cynical government. Uh, and the more that that perception kicks in, the more danger there is, particularly since they've invested so heavily in his persona. I'll see you. Pretty similar. I would say trust. I think it comes back to the promise on the electoral reform system, on Kinder Morgan for voters out in British Columbia. People, I think, projected on Justin Trudeau what they believed, and he kind of had it both ways in the last election. And he's had to make some tough decisions, and he's annoyed and hurt a lot of people and a lot of the young voters who decided to go out to the polls for the very first time. I think they're the ones who are the most... Um, hurt and annoyed that he has broken their um, their promise to them. If you had to pick a spot in this past year where you smiled or laughed about what was going on, you know, in a good way, what would it be? It was the day that uh, Malala Yousafzai gave her speech in the House of Commons, a very funny, inspiring speech. She talked about how girls should be able to, to learn and lead without fear. And uh, just to see all those women and girls lining the corridors of the House of, of, of Center Block uh, to see her come in, that made me smile. 
It wasn't oh. so elevated, and I, I picked it thinking of Andrew. It was, <laughs> but, but I was around for the 1988 election uh, and the subsequent one, and watching Brian Mulroney head into a cabinet meeting to brief a Trudeau cabinet on free trade with the U.S., I have to say that it made me smile and think of the ironies of political life. Yeah, I'll say, especially with him going in, being very not being able to actually say to reporters why he was going in, for sure. Um, but that irony oh, of a indeed. liberal uh, cabinet welcoming a conservative in. Okay, here's the last question uh, for the year. Um, when you uh, look back at this year and you were making the argument that Canadian politics is you know, alive and well, things are actually good, what would you point to as the reason for making that argument? Uh, I would say the opposition pushed back on the package of quote-unquote parliamentary reforms that the Liberals brought for, which had some legitimate reforms in them, but a lot of stuff that was just, let's make life easier for us as a government. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's partisanship on both sides. I'm not saying the opposition were there to be, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, but that's the value of partisanship is it's an adversarial system. And by pushing back, they were making an important point. They forced the government to back down on some of those changes and they preserved a lot of important and necessary parliamentary prerogatives. So good for them. Chantal. I went the other route uh, and I was struck by the capacity of so far, Canada's political class to work together on the Canada-U.S. file. Uh, premiers like Brad Wall were not friends of the Justin Trudeau government. Rona Ambrose going to Washington and, and stressing the, the Canadian message. And what a difference it is from our previous trade debates. There is not a province that has been speaking out of step on this. Uh, and I found that once in a while, they do behave like adults. All right. I've only got 30 seconds left for the two of you. Oh, very Healthy. quickly. I would say the 259,000 Canadians who took out membership to the Conservative Party, we often talk about political parties being dead. And here were people who were interested and engaged enough, whether they were New Democrats who just bought a membership to try to prevent another candidate or not. The fact that that many Canadians bought a membership, I thought, was really interesting. Jennifer. Andrew Weaver and John Horgan having, whoops, having their, uh, their press conference in front of the, the legislature in BC that said, hey, politics is alive and well, and even if you cast your ballot for a small party, it might mean something huge. It was uh, quite a moment. Thank you all. One more at issue, for me anyway. It comes next week, and it will be a reflective one with some of your questions as well about the past 15 years of at issue. More of tonight's National still to come. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, conflict mediator Adam Kahane has negotiated peace throughout the world's hotspots for 30 years. He shares his secrets on how to collaborate with the enemy on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Baby, my heart's on fire. Then you'll be left alone Oh, baby, telephone Eighty-five years ago today, the first telephones went on sale to the public. To give you an idea what sort of a telephone you could buy at that time, we asked the telephone company to dust off some of the ancient models stored in the basement of its University Avenue building. This attractive demonstration wasn't really in keeping with the telephone scenes of 1877. Originally, boys were employed as telephone operators. They were later replaced by girls when it was found they were too rude to customers. And this is something else that's in use now and will one day be a part of every home. It's called the video phone. If I'm off-center, you can't see me anymore. So, uh... You'd only want to do that if uh, you weren't properly dressed. The size, the shape, and the color has changed a little in the past 30 years, but it still does the same thing. Or does it? The fact is that the system to which this phone is connected has changed radically. Now this uses the phone, and this does, and so does this. The telecommunications industry has produced an electronic highway. Tim Barnett is checking in with his office. Hello, buddy. He's using his new high-tech cellular phone. It's got no wires, no jacks, and it travels anywhere. The people selling it claim it's the productivity tool of the 80s. It could equally be an expensive bust. To have her call me on my uh, cellular phone, I'd appreciate it. This gadget doesn't come cheap. It costs between $2,000 and $6,000 just to get the equipment, and there's call charges on top of that. Yesterday, they were gadgets used only by the rich and powerful. Today, your local pizza delivery is likely to have one. 
And in next to no time, so will most of us who want to have that phone, no matter where we happen to be. Research in Motion dominates a small industrial park in Waterloo, Ontario. It invented and manufactures a pager called a BlackBerry. Its unique feature, a keyboard that allows you to send and receive email, essentially in real time. Now, when Apple says it plans to make a new cell phone, people listen. Today, the company showed off its iPhone. With well, a Samsung touch screen has brought its fight for phone. smartphone supremacy to Apple's turf. If you refuse me, honey, you lose me, then you'll be left alone. Oh, baby, telephone, and tell me I'm your own. The National. The National. I got to try on a costume myself. We were dancing for quite a while. These red silk pants, big pants. You wouldn't wear them at work time or school time, but hammer time? Johnny Harris returns with Still Standing. The new season begins Tuesday, June 27th on CBC. has been described as the masterpiece of John Lennon's career and it's long been known that he drew inspiration from his wife Yoko Ono. Now 46 years after the song's release 84 year old Ono finally getting a writing credit on the classic. Right before his death John Lennon admitted the song was a joint effort. A lot of it the lyric and the concept came from Yoko, but those days I was a bit more selfish a bit more macho and I sort of omitted to mention her contribution. <laughs> Some of the words were taken from Ono's 1964 book of poetry, Grapefruit. The announcement was made at a National Music Publisher Association event last night, where Imagine was also named the Song of the Century. Well, songwriting is certainly one way to make a political statement, but now politics is making its way into a darker, more visual medium, video games. The CBC's Kim Brunhuber went to a gaming conference to see how that's playing out. The latest video games have been revealed, the new monsters, the new heroes. But as Canadian video game writer Elise Favis wanders North America's biggest video game showcase, she's noticed a shift. This year, there are more games brushing against the third rail of the gaming industry, politics. Video games, like any other art form, are going to respond to the world around them. You can pray on the way up. You can become a black veteran confronting racism. You think you're a hero. Or stop Nazis from taking over America. Be Trump. Or attack him. <laughs> I died the first time, but I got it the second time. It's pretty awesome. Jeff Franklin's playing a new game from Ubisoft Montreal. The baddies are Christian extremists. If you have games that are touching on a real life topic, Again, it just brings it back to being relatable, and it opens minds. And you are my children. The game's producer says it was in the works long before the U.S. election, but seems to reflect today's zeitgeist. You know, we don't have a crystal ball. We didn't know what was going to happen, but it's it's strange sometimes to, to hear echoing of some of the stuff that we're talking about in the game and that the people in the game are experiencing happening out in the real world. That means experts like Jesse Hennessy, who analyzes how family-friendly games are, says they'll have to add a third category to their reviews. Sex, violence, and now politics. If you come across as preaching your political agenda, you're going to alienate everybody who doesn't agree with you. And that's what makes politics a dangerous game. Big developers have a lot to lose if enough of their audience identifies with the villains. Nintendo, for instance, won't touch politics with a 10-foot Super Mario hammer. Making political statements are for other people to do. We want people to smile and have fun when they play our games. So, gamers, don't worry, there's no shortage of whimsy. 
But with technology increasingly blurring the line between the virtual and the real, it's not surprising if the games themselves are creating more relevant villains. And we will take you. More meaningful heroes. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. And that's The National for this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Mark Kelly. Thanks for watching.